The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. My name is Ryan Eborn, and I am here today on behalf of the marketing team with School Health. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today and participating in our Stop the Bleed webinar. In today's webinar, Karina Bilger will help you learn to stop the bleed by recognizing and stopping life-threatening blood loss. As many of you are probably aware, May is Stop the Bleed Month, and we're bringing you this webinar in an effort to support your response to trauma-related trauma emergencies and to help save lives through bleeding control. Before I turn the webinar over to uh, Karina, I'd like to review a few quick things about today's webinar. Uh, number one, we will not be taking audio questions at any point during the webinar, but you can submit your questions through the questions interface in GoToWebinar. Feel free to submit your questions anytime during the presentation, and we will uh, take some time to answer questions after Karina's uh, presentation is finished. Um, we're looking at about 30 to 40 minutes for the presentation. After that, we will have our, our question and answer session. Of course, we are recording this webinar as we do for each of our webinars, and after the webinar is, is finished, we will send you by email uh, a link for the recorded version so that you can play it back uh, if you want to review any of the information or share it with, with colleagues. Um, we will send that email along with your certificate of attendance for attending today's webinar, and you can expect to receive that within a couple of uh, within the next couple of days. You won't receive it right away as soon as the webinar is over, but uh, within the next day or two, we'll have that uh, link for the recording as well as your certificate of attendance. And lastly, if you are having any technical difficulties with either the audio or the visual portion of today's webinar, please contact GoToWebinar directly at 855-352-9003. Again, that uh, technical difficulties line with GoToWebinar is 855-352-9003. And now let's turn the time over to Karina. Thanks, Ryan, and hello, everyone. I usually start my in-person classes with how many people here today have taken a CPR class. All hands in the room usually go up, and then I ask them to keep their hands up if they have ever taken a Stop the Bleed class. In my last class to educators just like yourselves, a little over three months ago, only two hands remained up. There were 75 people in that room. This is why we're here today. You can make a difference. You joined today to learn. We have the power to change a tragic loss and turn it into a potential save. Yeah, I use graphic imagery, but most are simulated. It's important to get used to it. Without exposure, you can become a deer in headlights when faced with a traumatic incident. I know this to be true. At a hands-on training class for SROs and school administrators last year, it was a brilliant thing. We had a, a wound packing demonstration area. We had Quick Clot present, which is Z-Medica, TACMED, North American Rescue, who has the cat tourniquet. We had a great simulation and process, and every one of us had a station. My station that day just happened to be the wound trainer. The wound trainer itself was, in, well, a simulated leg with a very large hole in it, and we were using simulated blood, which kind of, I guess, looked real. Everything was going well until a woman approached my wound packing station. She slowly approached. She put on her, on her gloves that we had told her to use, but she approached very slowly. And as she got up in front of that wound packing model, she absolutely lost it. I could see her struggling. She almost fainted and she had to sit down. She taught me that if we don't teach with a sort of realism, how will the folks I speak to and preach to on Stop the Bleed, how will they know what to do and how will they handle a real situation. This is why I use the graphic imagery. It's not to you know, make this 
presentation just more exciting or make it gory. It's so that you get used to it. During the Vegas incident, more people were able to survive thanks to civilian-owned tourniquets and due to the basic bleeding control efforts of strangers. I want you to walk away from your desk today feeling like you can help. I want you to be empowered to become the difference between being that deer in headlights and becoming the reason one more life may live. With the right training, you can help save a life. With the right training, your students can help save your life. Everyone bleeds. Remember that time when you were in a hurry to make dinner and you chopped that onion just a little bit too quickly? Do you remember, were you in a panic? Did you know what to do? Were you, were you prepared? Did you know if you had a first aid kit available to you? Did you use the tools that were in that kit? Bleeding happens every day and all of us will bleed because we live in a when it happens world. We know the answer to this slide, yet only two people in that class I told you about had taken a Stop the Bleed class. Why is that? It's super simple now to have these classes and to take them. Everyone's offering them. The American Red Cross offers a 40 minute, or give or take 40 minute class online that is really quite informative. Call your local fire station. They offer classes all the time. They are more than willing to help. In fact, they want you to be educated and, and learn to help them. They can even help you to become an instructor so that you have the ability to teach others. It's a really simple process. It doesn't take a lot of your time. It just takes a little bit of dedication. Call School Health. They have the resources, materials, and products that can help you succeed in becoming an educator and teaching Stop the Bleed. You can make the difference between whether someone lives or dies. Be personally prepared. Personally prepared. Don't wait for others. These are different times and there is no real solution on the immediate horizon. Just remember, you can bleed out within five minutes or less. EMS usually takes longer to respond. In my rural community where I worked almost for 15 years in an ambulance, it could take me up to 45 minutes to respond. That's just too long. Remember, you can bleed out within five minutes. A mass shooting is defined as four or more casualties in one event. Last year, according to the Gun Violence Archives in the United States, we averaged one shooting per day. Twenty nineteen is well underway and it's been devastating. Fifteen school shootings within the first five months. And now we are uncovering delayed tragedies from earlier incidents. Survivors aren't only the injured. It can be anyone who was even remotely a part of the event. C I S D, Google it critical incident stress debriefing has been a part of my EMS world for years. It's slowly being introduced into your communities to support the survivors of tragedies like these, all survivors. Within EMS, what we do is we gather EMS personnel from the medic to the first responder. First responders are generally those that show up on scene before an EMT or a paramedic, and sometimes before law enforcement. But we gather all these people, including fire and others, whoever was involved in a serious situation that could have potentially difficulty with dealing with that incident. We try to do it within the first 24 to 48 hours. Of course, we're careful. We have HIPAA rules that we have to uh, adhere to. We sit down and we talk about the situation and we try to walk ourselves through it. There's all kinds of emotions. 
identify who in that group may need extra help dealing with it. And that's how we begin our CISD training. And a good example within my career would be a CPR call. For me, I have done several in my career, as many other EMTs, paramedics have, and first responders. Imagine a new first responder who shows up on scene and sees us performing CPR on someone for the very first time. That's obviously stressful, very stressful. But I have also seen in that same situation, but with a different person, perhaps even a paramedic who had several years experience and was very seasoned. She was so greatly affected by the perfume the patient was wearing. Stress triggers are different for everyone and sometimes unpredictable. So it's all about the survivors, whether it is the victim or those that were helping. Sadly, Columbine survivor Austin Eubanks battled addiction and died on Monday. Medicine is not enough, and Eubanks himself spoke on that subject. It's called survival's guilt, survivor's guilt. CISM is available to you for stress management. CISM, again, can be Googled, but it's critical incident stress management. Okay, let's get started on what to do within Stop the Bleed. Observe this carefully. We learned from the Boston bombing shown here that civilians are starting to become extremely proactive. There were tourniquets handed to bystanders by bystanders and bystanders who had tourniquets on their own person. That's part of the reason the fatalities were lower than we actually anticipated and expected. Take a look at the gentleman in the ball cap. He is holding pressure and it looks like on this particular woman, he is using perhaps even a t-shirt to hold pressure and to stop the bleed. He's being helped by another bystander. I also want you to notice the position his body is in. If it looks familiar, it's almost like a CPR pose that you've learned in the past. If you look behind in the background, you're going to see some blood and you are going to see a variety of different responders. I can't tell for sure if these are EMTs, first responders, or law enforcement officers, but what it does show us is that these people are busy. There are way too many patients for them to sort through, and they really need civilians like us to help them. Remember this, if they're breathing, look for bleeding. Air goes in and, in, in and out, and blood goes round and round. No one should die from external blood loss. What we've learned over the years is what generally kills a patient or a victim is a severe trauma to the head, chest, or explosive dismemberment. Potentially survivable are extremity wounds, abdominal, and airway wounds. How far can you run in 60 seconds? The Florida incident brought to light another issue that needed to be addressed further. People take time to process adverse events that unfold around them. Many stop and stare trying to figure out what is happening around them, and others become the ostrich that buries its head in the sand by dropping to the ground and praying they aren't seen. That's what happened in Fort Myers. At, in Fort Myers, at the baggage carousel, Five people died in one minute. Run, hide, fight. That incident in Fort Myers is what brought this around. We now call it run, hide, and fight. This isn't a perfect approach because circumstances may dictate how we can respond, but it's a good start and so that makes it good enough for me. Sometimes, unfortunately, though, you can't run or you can't hide. But if you can remember this process, run, hide, and fight, at least it'll stop you from being the ostrich. 
let's begin now with how to respond once you feel you are safe and there is a victim. You've got to make sure you're safe first. The ABCs of bleeding, if this sounds familiar, it's because you've probably learned something similar in your CPR class. I think you'll find a lot of similarities in how we teach it. A stands for alert, call 911, get help, make others aware. B is for bleeding, find that bleeding injury. It may not be visible to you at first, and you may see more than one bleeding site. C, compress. Apply pressure to stop that bleeding. Apply very strong pressure in most cases. Things stops or slows with pressure, but can start again when pressure is removed. The key is that it stops with pressure, like a nosebleed. Severe bleeding may be spurting or oozing, but does not stop with pressure or soaks through several bandages. My next two slides are a little graphic, but widely used for the purpose of educating us on what spurting blood and oozing blood may look like. Don't go it alone. Alerting 911 will get emergency medical responders, police officers on the scene. You've got to call 911 yourself or directly find someone. Again, this is just the way you learned it in CPR class. You call 911. Identify those bleeds. Blood that is cooling on the ground is considered to be that oozing blood. Clothing will be soaked with blood, bandages that are soaked with blood. Look for all of those signs. This is the blood spurting out of a wound. When you look at this, you have to remember that you're going to be applying pressure. Pressure on this is going to be a lot of pressure and force. It takes a lot to stop a bleed like this. Blood soaking the sheet or clothing that is also the sign that we need to look for. Cooling around in the person, cooling blood around the person is a definite sign. Let's talk about the different areas. Arm and leg or extremity, extremity bleeding is survivable. Minutes are precious. Remember, we can bleed out and die in less than five minutes. Tourniquet direct pressure and or stuffing the wounds can make the transition from victim to survivor. Torso or trunk wounds can be a little trickier for you to manage. Direct pressure and wound packing are your two options. Keeping in mind, of course, that on a neck injury, not to cut off the carotid artery. I'm guessing you all know where to find the carotid artery, right? Google it if you aren't sure. If you can't find a bleed to pack or hold pressure on, you may see signs of internal bleeding that could be like bruising. How does blunt trauma happen? Think of something like a car accident where the driver hits the steering wheel. Chances are the force of the impact may cause internal bleeding. Or even, okay, think of a sports injury where the victim is hit in the chest with sports equipment or a ball. There's not much you can do here except to keep them calm and perhaps look for signs of shock. If you have an opportunity, look up Google signs of shock. And of course, get help. Let's go through some of the algorithms. These are supposed to help you remember the process. The first thing you're going to do is ensure your safety. Look for life-threatening bleeding. Remember, it may not be visible to you right away. You may have to remove clothing to find it. Is a trauma first aid kit available to you? Where is it? Have someone get it. If it's not available to you, use any clean cloth or gauze. Okay. We say clean cloth or gauze, 
but the reality is use any cloth or gauze that you may have available. I'm not so concerned in the field with maintaining sterility or cleanliness. Uh, the ER department can worry about that. Let us worry about saving that person. So use any clean cloth or cloth or gauze, apply steady, steady pressure, and hold it directly on the wound. Direct pressure is fairly easy skill to remember. The key is to understand that in order to stop bleeding, you will need to use a lot of it. Remember CPR class when you were told to interlace your fingers and hold your arms rigid directly over the person? It offers you a little bit more strength and definitely more stability. Don't try and dial 911 with one hand and apply pressure with the other. Call 911 first or direct someone to do that. Never ever release pressure. And believe me when I say that can be really hard to do. Use any clean cloth or cloth, for example, like a shirt. It can be a sock. It can be just about anything to cover the wound. If the wound is large and deep, try to stuff it into the wound. Sometimes it's deeper than you think it is. Apply continuous pressure with both hands directly on top of that bleeding wound. Push down as hard as you can. This takes a lot of force. And if you're a very little person, it's a lot harder for you to maintain that. It gets to be very tiring. So keep that in mind. So you want to have good posture. You want to be able to interlace your fingers and hold that pressure and be steady. Remember to hold that pressure until relieved by medical professionals. Back to our algorithm. Is the trauma kit available? Yes. Where is the wound? Is it in the arm or the leg? Is a tourniquet available immediately? If the answer is yes, apply the tourniquet above the bleeding site. Tighten it until the bleeding stops, not trickles. Tighten it until the bleeding stops. I think we all know at this point what a tourniquet is. So let's learn a little bit about how to use them. Apply the tourniquet immediately if life-threatening bleeding is seen from an arm or leg. It can be placed on top of clothing if necessary. We always tell you, please place it two to three inches above the bleeding wound. But sometimes, especially for people like me, that two to three inches is iffy. Does this look like two to three inches or, or is that too much? Or maybe that's too little. If you can't remember that or if it's not intuitive for you, just remember high and tight. So place it two to three inches above the bleeding wound or as high and tight as you can go. But never, do not apply it directly over a knee or an elbow joint. Don't apply it directly over a pocket that contains bulky items. This could possibly happen if you're doing it in the leg. You have to remove those items from the person or remove the clothing. Tighten the tourniquet until bleeding stops. There are so many different tourniquets on the market these days. Uh, it seems like every week there's another one. These are the three most popular that you will probably see or have already heard of. The first one I have up here is called the Combat Application Tourniquet, more commonly known as the CAT. In fact, I doubt most anyone would know what CAT stands for. Um, they're so used to calling it that. It's kind of like Kleenex. It's very easy to use windless tourniquet. The soft Tactical tourniquet is also another one. It is more commonly referred to as a soft T. Um, I don't know a lot of people that can say soft tactical tourniquet without stuttering. I certainly can't and usually do stutter. 
The last one is called the Stretch Wrap and Tuck Tourniquet. It's a very simple device, um, more commonly known as the SWAT T Tourniquet. What I can tell you and, and really caution you on right now is to avoid knockoff tourniquets. They are becoming more and more common in, the, in, in our world, and it's unfortunate. Um, so we need to avoid them. Trust your supplier. School health doesn't carry fake ones. The statement that you see in front of you, that is a direct quote from an executive at North American Rescue Products the manufacturers of the cat tourniquet. I had asked him how he would address knockoffs to the public because the cat tourniquet has had problems with previous generations of being knocked off. His response, I think, is absolutely perfect, don't you? If it's cheaper than it should be, it's probably too good to be true. Last thing to note, if you run across a blue tourniquet, these are generally trainers. We use them to teach hands-on classes. It's probably been used a hundred times or more and abused to some degree. They are not meant for human use and should not be used that way. So if it's blue, assume it's a training tourniquet. Let's talk a little bit about the cat tourniquet since that is the most popular one out there. It's a windless style tourniquet, simple to use, and it's most commonly used by the military, US military, EMS, law, enforce, law enforcement, and foreign military. And most recently, of course, now it's brought into our world. We are going to get these slides since I'll be showing you a video. I left them in the presentation so that you can reference back to them later if you wish. The video you're about to see is presented by North American Rescue. Welcome to the Cat Generation 7 Instructions for Use, two in an application. Step one, wrap the band around the limb, pass the red tip through the slit of the buckle and position the cat two to three inches above the bleeding site directly to the skin. Step two, hold the band tightly and pass that back on itself all the way around the limb, but not over the rock clips. Bands should be tight enough that the tips of three fingers cannot be slid between the band and the limb. If the tips of three fingers slide under the band, retighten and re -secure. Step three, twist the rod until the bleeding has stopped. Step four, secure the rod inside a clip and lock it into place. Check for bleeding and distal pulse. If bleeding is not controlled or distal pulse is present, consider additional tightening or applying a second cat above and side by side to the first. Reassess. Step five, route the band between the clips and over the rod. Secure a rod and band with time strap. Record time of application. The Cat Generation 7 is available for purchase from www.narescue.com or call us at 888-689-6277. Okay. That video is great, but a lot of people have questions as to why is that man touching the bottom of his foot like that? Um, for the civilian side of us, we don't, we're, we don't see that every day. And what that is, is that is going to be the dorsal pedis pulse point. So everyone has a pulse right about that same spot in their foot. So if you're curious about it, you know, find it on your partner. But again, you can always go ahead and Google it. 
um, just so you know where it is. But it is a pulse point on the top of your foot. We commonly refer to radial and carotid pulses, and you're probably very familiar with those. Um, but this one's not widely heard of with non-medical personnel. So let's go through some of the key points of stopping the bleeding with a tourniquet. I'm going to touch on very lightly homemade tourniquets because I do get a lot of people that say, I go out in the wilderness and I don't need a tourniquet because I know that ultimately I can use two sticks and maybe two pens and I can use a rubber band and create my own and MacGyver it. Well, honestly, there are no studies that prove that these are effective. Um, I suppose if you have nothing better to use, fine, but it's definitely not recommended. They're difficult to make and apply without extensive practice. So not recommended, and we try to shy away from that. If the bleeding is not stopped once you put a tourniquet on, you can apply a second one if available just above the first one and tighten it just like you did before. What we commonly refer to this is you have a first tourniquet available to you, and then you carry a backup tourniquet. People wonder and worry about amputations. Oh my gosh, I'm going to cut off his blood supply and he's going to lose his limb. Well, there haven't been any documented cases where a tour tourniquet has been placed in, in place for less than two hours that this has happened. But it's always get, best to get the patient to a trauma center as soon as possible so that they can make sure that bleeding is completely controlled and the tourniquet is removed. One thing I, I can say here is if you have the opportunity and you remember, once you apply a tourniquet, if you can sharp, use a Sharpie pen or anything and write on their forehead or anywhere that's visible, clearly visible to medical personnel, the time that you put the tourniquet on there, they find that extremely helpful. So again, if you can write down the time somewhere or at least remember it to tell personnel, that would be great. So yes, okay, put that tourniquet on. It's better to risk damage to the arm or leg than to have that victim lead to death. And remember, practice tourniquets, the blue ones, should never be used during a real patient incident. Tourniquets hurt, they hurt a lot. Patients will complain. I've had several that have. I can't even imagine the pain. I can because I've done it in practice on myself and my loved ones, um, but it's extremely painful. What I like to tell people is if the patient is complaining or the, or the victim is complaining, that's a good thing. That means you're actually doing it right. Explain what you're doing to that victim. Talk to them. Tell them help is on the way. You're sorry it's painful, but it's doing the job it needs to do. Pain doesn't mean you put it on wrong. It means you did it right. Pain doesn't mean you should take the tourniquet off. You always leave it on. Remember, once a paramedic or EMT arrives, they will treat the pain with medication. These are common mistakes that happen. Um, not using a tourniquet because you get that deer in headlights look. Is this, you know, massive bleeding? Is this life-threatening? Not making a tourniquet tight enough to stop the bleeding. If, you, if the bleeding doesn't stop and it trickles, that's not stopping the bleed. Not using a second tourniquet if needed may be a problem. But just know, hey, if you carry one, that's a good start. I'm happy with that. If you carry a backup, a backup tourniquet, even better. Periodically loosening the tourniquet to allow blood flow is a no-no. Please don't do it. Do not loosen a tourniquet. And never remove it. Only a physician or a surgeon should loosen or remove it. Back to the algorithm. Is a tourniquet available immediately? The answer is no. Use a hemostatic agent, a bleeding control agent, gauze, or any gauze or clean cloth. And then remember to apply continuous direct pressure. 
Hemostatic dressings have a lot of different names. Some call them blood stoppers, and some call for quick clot. Quick clot, like the cat tourniquet, is kind of like Kleenex. Quick clot is a brand name of a hemostatic agent. Don't be afraid to use them. Instead, know that stuffing a wound with this will give you a huge amount of immediate benefit to you and your survivor. If you want to carry this in your kit like I do, like my family does, like my son does in school, just talk to your school health representative. They can help you find the right kit for you. Hemostatic agents are called Quick Clot, they're called Celoc, Kytoflex, Kytogaz, kind of like the tourniquet market, they're becoming you know, more and more common every day, but they're also more and more available to you. The two most common are the two at the top, Celoc and Quick Clot. Um, I've used them both and I carry both. Okay, we're again, we're gonna pass through a couple of these slides. We're going to skip them because you can go back to these later and I do have a video to show you. It's the wound packing video that we had before. The H&H &H compressed gauze can be used to pack a wound and slow severe hemorrhaging. Always wear protective gear such as gloves before packing a wound. Before inspecting the wound, get out the gauze or packing material you will be using. Pull six to eight inches of gauze from the roll. Hold the roll of gauze in one hand and the end of the gauze in the other. Form the end of the gauze into a small ball to form the initial pack. Then probe the wound gently with a finger to ensure there is no shrapnel and, if possible, find the source of bleeding and apply pressure. Once pressure is applied, do not remove your finger. Using your other hand, feed the initial pack into the wound and push it down until you reach the end of the wound. Continue feeding the gauze two to three inches at a time into the wound. Keep pushing gauze firmly into the wound to apply pressure. Once the wound is completely packed, place the remainder of the gauze roll on top of the wound and apply firm pressure. Keep in mind that it may be necessary to use additional gauze if the wound is large. Hold pressure for 10 minutes, then inspect the wound to make sure bleeding has slowed. Then remove the gauze to inspect the wound. Apply a compression bandage to keep the gauze in place. Wound packing is really scary. Remember that woman I told you about earlier in the presentation? Well, that was actually the model that she got woozy over. Um, it's hard because if you're a non-medical person, you haven't seen this before, more than likely. Um, so it is, a, it is a scary thing because you can remember, well, keep in mind, it can be a really deep hole. Get the gauze as deep as you can. And you've got to remember that things get in the way in that hole. Bones can get in the way, fragments of bones can get in the way, and fragments of foreign material can get in the way. But it's an, an extremely important step for you to remember. For large, deep wounds, wound packing can be performed in children just as in adults. You're using the same exact techniques. Tourniquet use with children. Most children, children under the, well, children over the age of 11, you can use an adult tourniquet on them very easily. What you have to be concerned with are people with smaller limbs, and the Pediatric Society called that children under 11. So people with small limbs or extremely large limbs may have difficulty, you know, occluding blood flow with those types of tourniquet where, so this kind of makes the SWAT T um, a better choice for using as a tourniquet on those individuals. After arrival of medical responders, if you have any blood on you, please wash thoroughly with soap and water. Remove all of the blood. And notify medical responders, if possible, if you've been exposed. It may not be possible. The scene may be too chaotic and that opportunity may not come around, but you should notify them. Preferably, you're going to be wearing non-latex gloves, which you found in your first aid kit, I'm hoping and you can use those as a barrier between you and blood. 
let's summarize this real quick. The ABCs of bleeding, A is for alert, alert, call someone, call 911, get them started, have someone call 911 for you. B, bleeding, find the bleeding injury. Keep in mind, it may not be a visible injury. You may have to cut clothing or remove clothing, and there may be more than one bleeding site. C is for compress, apply pressure to stop that bleeding, and remember, that could be a lot of pressure. Some of the things you need to think about. Get yourself a first aid kit. Put it in your car. Keep a small one on your person. Wherever it is you spend a lot of time, you should have a first aid kit. Know your surroundings. This is so important. If you attend a place of worship on a regular basis or if you go to a shopping mall on a regular basis, whatever your normal routes are, you should have a planned escape route for, route for those. Make a plan with your kids in case something does happen. Why not? I mean, think about it. We plan escape routes and communication plans for earthquakes and tornadoes. You need an escape plan, a plan of action. Get something done with your kids. Teach them. Put a small kit in their backpack. Now, you might be raising an eyebrow saying, I'm not going to do that. Well, okay, my son was exposed at the age of five to, you know, this industry, thanks to me being an EMT paramedic for a while. But, you know, I really believe they need to learn how to use a tourniquet as soon as they're able. They need to learn how to use several tourniquets because the one that you carry or give them in their backpack that may not be the same one that you end up using someday. You might be using someone else's, which is a different tourniquet. My son now attends Oregon State University, and he and his friends all carry first aid kits or at minimum a tourniquet in their backpacks. Why? Those backpacks go everywhere with them in their school, and they know how to use them. Above all, remember what to do in an emergency. Remember how to stop the bleed. Know how to use the equipment in all of your kits at home and at work. Always double check your kits. Look for expiry dates. Um, you know, if you've got a hemostatic agent in there, there's an expiry date on those. Um, if you're looking at quick clot, most of those varieties of quick clot expire within five years, but there are some that expire in three. When you decide on making your first aid kit or purchasing one, contact School Health. They can help you figure out which kit is right for you because it can be a variety of factors that you need to consider. You need to consider things like, do I want a basic kit that just has a tourniquet and perhaps a compression dressing and some other things, or do you want to add a hemostatic agent? The other concern question you'll have is, how much do I want to spend? In school, I highly recommend that the teachers have them in their desks, but they know how to use them as well as their students, and they know where to find it. The only thing more tragic than a death is a death that could have been prevented. Thanks for your participation today. I hope that you come away learning something or having questions for me. And for further information, here's the place that you can go. I highly recommend redcross.org. They have a great website. Okay, thanks, Karina, for taking the time to present this important information. Um, we have received a few questions, and we want to take some time to get to those. Before I do, I wanted to mention one of the web addresses you're seeing on your screen for the School Health Safety Center. Um, most, I, I believe, actually all of the products that Karina mentioned during her presentation, the Quick Clot, the SWAT T, the CAT T, all of those products are available through our School Health Safety Center. Um, you can find useful information for re emergency response, and you can even request a free consultation with one of our emergency response experts if you have questions about getting the right solution for your school. So let's jump into the, uh, the questions that we've got here. A um, couple of questions that have come in about finding classes. Uh, one of the, the questions is, how do I find a class near me? 
Okay, that's really easy. In fact, it's become a lot easier. You can go to stopthebleed.org and look for a class near you. You can call your local fire department or EMS agency, and they are always holding classes. And if they're not holding a class and you want one for your school system, they are more than willing to come in and do it. Lots of different ways to find a class. Okay. Um, got a question here from James who says, how do you address teachers and educators that say this will never happen to them or they don't want to think about these types of incidents? Well, I hope, James, that this presentation has kind of changed that for a lot of people. Because like I said, it, it's not a when, it, you know, if it happens, it's when it happens. We all bleed. And the statistics are scary. What do I say to these people? I say, don't be the ostrich. Exactly. Um, question, a couple of questions about tourniquets. Um, first portion of this was, I thought we weren't supposed to use tourniquets. And then secondly, uh, when you're using a tourniquet, do you want to feel a pulse uh, after the application or do you want to not feel a pulse? Okay, the old school thinking that we were all taught, every one of us, was not to use a tourniquet because they're problematic and they, you know, the person can lose a limb. And that was taught to us, oh, I don't know, for 20 years. But what happened was military came around and they said, we want tourniquets. And they started using the, the cat tourniquet. Um, and they discovered through research um, and due diligence that tourniquets actually save lives. And for the most part, they did not cause amputations. So what happened from there was the EMS community, so people like me who work on an ambulance or perhaps you know in an OR, um, we suddenly, about five, six years ago, maybe, maybe even a little bit longer, were suddenly allowed to use them. And of course, it's the trickle down thing, right? So it went from military to civilian EMS in the United States, and now it trickles down into civilian use, because honestly, we can save more lives with a tourniquet. Uh, the second part of your question was, I'm sorry, can you repeat it? Yeah, it was, uh, it was in relation to feeling a pulse after a, a tourniquet is applied. I, I remember you saying a, about a distal pulse, and do you want to feel that or not? You, you do not want to feel that. The whole idea is that you're shutting off the, the blood flow. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, as long as we're on tourniquets, I've got a couple of other questions here. Do you have any thoughts on the TS310 time strip tourniquet? Are you familiar with that uh, tourniquet, Karina? You know, I'm not that familiar with that tourniquet, so I can't really offer a valid opinion. What I can say is there are so many different varieties out there that you just need to, I don't know, Google, I guess, find out which ones might suit your purpose better. Um, the one thing I, I ask you to do is always look for tourniquets that are intuitive, at least to some degree, so that you can find them easy to use and that your students, regardless of age, whether they're six or they're 18, so that they can find it easy to use as well. Um, just, you know, just, just do a little research and find the tourniquet that works best for your needs. And the other thing that uh, is a resource for everyone out there is, of course, us at School Health. We have experts on staff. Um, we have a wide range of, of tourniquets that are available. If you're not sure which one to use, give us a call. We're happy to talk through some options with you and find the best solution for your school. Um, I'm seeing a, a question here. Um, so Monica is asking if she is, is wrong to gather that if it's spurting blood, then a tourniquet should be used. If it's oozing blood and packing in pressure is more appropriate. Is that, is that a correct assumption or just a, do we need to make a correction here? Well, spurting blood and oozing blood, they're both bad, right? And without proper control for blood loss, they, the person can bleed out within five minutes. You will use a tourniquet on both of these types. The idea is if you cannot stop the bleed with direct pressure, or you know you can't stop it with direct pressure, you're going to need to apply that tourniquet. If you've got one oozing like you saw in that video, um, which, of course, that particular injury was probably a little bit longer in duration, but 
oozing blood, especially blood that you can see that's, you know, soaking through and just won't stop, that needs a tourniquet. Okay, thank you. All right, um, basic elastic stretch tourniquets. Why aren't basic elastic stretch tourniquets uh, used like the ones that are used by lab technicians? That's actually a really good question. Uh, the problem is, A, they weren't meant for that, and so they probably wouldn't withstand the pressure needed. It's, you know, like, the, they're talking about, like, the ones you use to start an IV. Um, and also, they're too narrow. It's, you need something a lot wider. If you use something that narrow, it's going to hurt like heck. And I mean hurt worse than anything. If you have the wider tourniquet, like the one you saw, the squat T tourniquet, that's wider, so it's less painful. Um, and those are meant, and they're tested to be, to be tourniquets. The others are not, not for, you know, two hours at a time. Okay, thank you. Do you know, um, Karina, in your experience, when you're outfitting a school with first aid kits, do you have recommendations for where they should go, how many, uh, anything along those lines? Um, I do have recommendations. You know, in the beginning when we started the Stop the Bleed process, I talked to a lot of administration or administrators for school systems, and they'd say, oh, yeah, we've got a central location. Um, we put it next to the AED. Well, that's okay if the shooter's not there or if the incident is really close by, but chances are it's not going to be, you know, easy to access. So, you know, like your AEDs now, they're, you know, they're spaced out a little bit differently so that they're easier to reach. So a good place to keep them, if you're doing, if you know, if you're following that process and you're putting them every so so many square feet, if you're putting a stop the bleed kit next to your AED, then that's perfect. People know where to find it. But on top of that, it's important for you to have one in your classrooms, um, in your gymnasiums, everywhere that that you know you can be trapped. And in those classroom settings, uh, there's two ways you can go. I mean. You can just have one, a little basic kit or a couple basic kits somewhere where it's easy, easily accessible to the, the student and to the, um, the professor. But the other thing to keep in mind is you can create a kit using, you know, an old paint bucket where you put cat litter in there because you can use it as a, you know, as a toilet later. But you can also put things in there like tourniquets, your first aid kit, and all kinds of things and just keep that in the back of the classroom. But the key is everyone has to know where to find these and they have to be able to know how to use them. Exactly, thank you. Um, we talked about, or, or you talked about, uh, hemostatic gauzes like a, a quick clot gauze. Can you tell us a little yes. bit, bit more about hemostatic agents and what they do? So hemostatic agents are wonderful. They actually help clots, well they form a clot. So they make your job a little bit easier. So as you're stuffing the wound, it's forming a clot of its own. And what that allows for you to do is it stops the bleeding a heck of a lot faster. And it requires, you still have to hold pressure, but it, it, it's a lot easier to do than without a hemostatic agent. And the hemostatic agents are, um, they're intuitive. I mean, you stuff it in the wound just like you would a gauze. Um, so it's just a, it's just a, I like it and I think everyone should carry it if they can afford to do so. Okay, thank you. Um, I've got a question here and I, I know that we had talked about this before, Karina, you and I. I, I don't think that we were talking about it online, but can you talk to us about timing with a tourniquet? How long um, can a tourniquet safely be used um, you know, before there's danger, for example, to, to the limb? Well, okay, so two things on that. First, it, we always tell people under two hours. So usually that's obtainable, right? We can usually get them to a facility or get some type of uh, medical professional to, to that patient within those two hours. But let's just say that we couldn't. And this is just a let's just say. Let's just say we couldn't. What would you do? Remove the tourniquet? You know, it's, it's, you can't remove a tourniquet once you put it on because it's life or limb, you know? Yeah, exactly. So my answer is simply, it's gotta be under two hours 
but honestly, there's not much you can do. You just do the best you can and get help as soon as you can. Okay. And then uh, let me just get one last question in here. So uh, let's see, I've got Sheila here saying, if the tourniquet is not available, how do you feel about using a belt? How effective would a belt be? Well, that goes back to the homemade thing, right? Um, they probably will not be effective. You'd probably have to train with it several times to figure out a way to, to MacGyver it. Um, some of you may not know that term, but, you know, to jerry-rig it. Um, I, it's not recommended. It's recommended that you do carry a tourniquet. They're so readily available. I mean, school health has some awesome prices on some of these things. Um, but again, you know, if, if you're out there and you don't have anything, improvising is probably the best you can do. So yeah, I mean, I would try anything. Okay, thanks. All right, I think that uh, we're getting close on time here, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, wrap up. I'd like to thank everybody for attending. I know that we have some questions here that we did not have time to get to, and uh, if we did not answer your question directly, please know that we will reach out to you directly with an answer to your question. Um, I'd like to offer a big thank you to Karina Bilger for sharing her wealth of knowledge with us today. This has been an excellent presentation. Um, and then one last note here. After you exit the webinar today, you'll see a survey window come up. And we would ask that each of you take a, a few moments for the, this brief survey. Um, I think it's just about five questions. It's not very long. But it helps us understand if you know what we're doing here today is helpful to you or if we need to make changes. So please participate in this survey. And with that, I will end today's broadcast. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Thank you.